So, today's uh, topic, uh, we're going to be uh, discussing some quality assurance processes. Oh, oh. Um, having to do with uh, issue tracking, monitoring bug counts, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about traceability, sort of building on what we did last time. Okay, um, and there'll be transitions for each of these. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, the broad motivation for the first couple of topics here is that software development gives rise to tremendous amounts of what can be called detailed complexity. There's a lot of things to keep track of. A lot of things to pay attention to. And I've given some of them here. One that we'll be spending particular time on today is the issue of defect reports, or possible defect reports. And this is not a matter of just saying, oh, I encountered a problem in doing this. It's a matter of often describing in a fairly detailed way what happened, what you were doing that gave rise to this, what version of the software it was with, on what sort of machine you encountered, uh, you encountered this sort of bug. Um, and it's not just that, it's not just what happened initially. This sort of defect report needs to be tracked. It needs to be followed. And why would you follow a defect report? Why would you need to put extra information on as time goes on as to what its status is? Anyone? So if I had a report of a defect, I said, there is software you know, that you show me, um, it shows a typo in a certain drop down. Why would, you, why would you need to do anything more than know about that? Keep a 
track of these things is just a lot of complexity. If we have to do it in our head, we're often in a bad way. It's, it's inconvenient, we forget things, there's misunderstanding. What's in my head is different what's in your head. You think you're going to do it, I think I'm going to do it, and that's just not obvious. So it's much more convenient from an operational standpoint to have these things maintained by a computer. I mean, these are the sort of things computers do a great job at keep a tracking of a lot of detail, doing bookkeeping, right? Straightforward, fairly simple rules about the order, you know, for if you report them up, diagnose it, eventually fix it, and you don't fix it before it's reported, for example. It's a very straightforward set of rules, and, and software can help us manage these things. So at an operational level, we gain a lot of benefit from using software that helps us do bookkeeping on these sort of issues. It takes a lot of load off our mind, a lot of things out of our head, and puts it in a shared place where lots of people can see it, and where we're not having that risk of forgetting it, right? So if I get sick, for example, it doesn't, you know, the knowledge of these things is maintained and still shared with the group. But there's another benefit for keeping these information in automated software, and that's a benefit for decision making. You can, particularly as a project manager, sometimes as a dev lead or test lead, test lead and sometimes it's just as members of the team, you can often make better decisions once you have statistics on, for example, what defects are out there. For example, if you know that there are only level three defects and below, priority three and below defects, you're doing pretty well approaching that deadline to show to Dr. Bowser. Priority three things, you know, the low, lower priority things, the lower priority items, perhaps, in your way of classifying them. And, and um, you know, you've got the big ones all under control. There's going to be no loss of data in front of her. There's going to be no crashes. On the other hand, if you see a couple priority one bugs in the list right now, you know, okay, we really got to get on the ball before tomorrow's demo and get these things resolved because it could really embarrass us. So for decision making, information about what bugs are out there, what's their status, who's working on them is really useful. Okay. This is a long-term investment. I showed this slide before, I believe, um, and it shows a um, uh, number of uh, weeks of testing here on the x-axis and the number of cumulative defects found for various space parts. So the Voyager, Miguel, and Galileo launched by NASA in the States National Aeronautic and Space Administration. And what's notable is that, you know, these projects start off with a large, large set of undiagnosed defects, defects that aren't yet recognized. And over time, those defects are, are found and hopefully resolved, right? So this is the cumulative number that have been found per 1,000 lines of code. And initially, it's very small. And then as testing goes on and exploration goes on, it rises, rises, rises. And what's notable is these defects are being found years out. Remember, a year is about you know, 52 weeks, so somewhere down here. So we're talking many years defects are still being found in this system. These are comparatively smaller systems compared to something like Eclipse today, or Windows, or what have you, you know, which are millions of lines of, of code that might be involved. Here you're dealing with a comparatively small, well-defined code base. Okay, um, that sort of slide and the fact that, that defects start undiagnosed and go through stages resolution, discovery and resolution, um, is, is a reflection of the fact that there's many stages in a defects life, or a, and I'm going to use this term, STI, this, um, system trouble incident, okay? Um, so somewhat more neutral term than defect and a lot more neutral than bug. Because some of these things might not be bugs. It might not be logic errors in the program. It might be based on an inconsistency again with the documentation, with the help system. Or, uh, or they might be based on, indeed, a, a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, an SDI, you suffer trouble, it's, there are things that are undiagnosed, and then there's things that are perceived possible ones, and then there's actual distinct defects, actual 
actual distinct problems. Then there's triage problems, bugs that have been judged worth fixing, that are not merely distinct and actual, not merely um, recognized as significant and as we say active, but they're actually, someone's made a decision, yes, we're going to fix this thing. We're definitely going to fix this thing. We're on it. And you're going to have bugs are then assigned to developers. And then developers work on them, and sometimes they fix them, and sometimes they don't. The fault feedback ratio in programs will mention in a later lecture the idea is that a certain fraction of bugs that are fixed they're actually not fixed, or they cause new bugs. And that ratio can vary from something like 10% to 50%. Someone says, hey, I fixed this bug. Don't take, take that at face value. They, they might not have been successful fixing because they didn't understand what the bug was. Maybe they were too rushed. Or maybe they created new bugs in its place. Does that ever happen? Big time. Big time. Just squeeze the balloons. You squeeze it here, it pops out there. That's a bad situation, but it happens. Um, there's fixed bugs and and, um, and then uh, I noted bugs that are caused by other bug fixes and bugs revealed by fixing other bugs. Okay, so let's talk about this uh, this sort of process. And I know this slide is probably hard to pick up, particularly from the back of the room, but um, here we have. The, the bug process diagrammed into several several pieces. Okay. We have undiagnosed bugs, and that's where bugs originate. And we have a we have a code base, and there's some undiagnosed defects. We've just written it, and perhaps we've done some unit testing, but there's no bugs yet found. But there may be a bunch of hidden bugs in there we don't know about. Right? A bunch of hidden problems. And as we test it, maybe it's us or maybe it's other people, those become a reported defects. Somebody notices, hey, something's going wrong here. That's not how it's supposed to work. And they report it. Right? So we call those bug reports. Now, bug reports are helpful, but they, again, can't be taken at face value. Why not? Anyone? Why do we have to look with a gimlet eye? A little bit of, of suspicion on a bug report by saying this is definitely a defect. Suppose there's a, a bug report I get. Why do I say it's not definitely a defect? Yeah? Well, it could be, uh, well, the way I was approaching it, was, uh, it could be a defect, but it could be Okay, that's that's true. So there may be a problem in the description. Um, yeah. uh, and, and that can occur. It can be a, a description which is is off base. Um, so um, you know, I, I wrote down something here related to that. Mm -hmm. Bug reports based on incorrect understanding. So, you know, they're trying to run your system. They they're trying to run the survey app on an iPhone. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And someone might say, oh, there's a problem with your app. Well, no. There's a problem with the understanding here. We, It's explicit that it doesn't run. It only runs on Android. And so there's a problem here with this defect <coughs> report. It's reporting something that's not truly a defect. People understand that. Appreciate that. Alternatively, someone may say, oh, this feature isn't working, but it's because they're understanding what the feature is supposed to do is off base. They have an old understanding. Or they're thinking about features which have not yet been implemented, not yet promised. So again, they have a misunderstanding of what's promised with the, with the software. But often what, what's going on here is that there are outdated defects. Defects, they're running an old version of, of the app. This happens quite a lot. You'll notice on Android, sometimes you um, maybe send an AP to yourself via your Gmail. And you download it, and you install it, and you think you installed, and the new app should be there. But it's 
it's actually because of some sort of caching behavior. It's actually running the old app before this new pad. You say, oh, this isn't working. This still isn't working. I thought you'd fix that button. You know, I'm going to report it as a defect. And it turns out that because of caching, you weren't, worked, weren't actually running the newest version of the system. Mm -hmm. um, it can happen very easily. I've seen it happen to so many. Um, finally, these defects in the bug reports can include duplicates. What do you mean by it includes duplicates? Why would I say that? Duplicate feedback report. Why would I say that? How could that happen? and gentlemen, we go through a process called, and this is or it's, you know, both cases it's MP, someone just pressed it accidentally, what have you. Um, so, or, you know, someone found that it was a hardware problem, right? The pro their program, their, their phone was acting flaky because they had, they had imbibed too much steam when they were in the shower or something like that, right? Um, so the sanitization process deals with these things, okay? It deals with these problems. And then you get to a stage of what we call active bugs. And this, again, this is something you're responsible for. What's an active bug? What's the notion of an active bug? How is the difference between a bug report? Does an active, we call an active defect, or active defect, and associate with that active defect report. And that's been sanitized. So we're confident it's not just the duplicate of another one that was previously reported. We're, we're confident it's not, not based on some big misunderstanding. And that process of sanitization takes a bit of effort. Someone has to actually do that. You know, someone has to think about it and say, is this real? Mm -hmm. And often the process of directed triage will involve some of that, but that's something that a, um, that a test lead, for example, might take a lead on, is, is sort of wading through the bug reports and saying, is this a duplicate? Is this one a duplicate? And often that gives key information about where we're at for the project. Okay, um, sanitization may also involve assigning priorities to it, priorities and severities to the bug report. Okay, so we're we're actually classifying how serious is this thing in terms of the severity of the problems it can cause, and how big a priority is it to fix? Why would I separate those ladies and gentlemen? Why do I make that distinction? Priority versus severity. <laughs> Give me an example of something that's high, high severity but low priority. Well, give me some examples of things that are high severity. Anyone? Yeah. Locks the entire system when this starts. Locks up the system. Locks up your phone. Okay. Of course, is a cold start. Okay. Great. Another one. Second ball. System bombs out, right? Crashes. Another one? Wipes uh, data. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. That's an example of what I call a system that offers negative value. You can have systems that offer virtually no value. Click on it. Not negative. That's bad. What's worse than that is a system that corrupts data, <coughs> like corrupts documents that are, you know, your important documents in your system, or that wipes out things in your hard drive. System can do damage. It can extract negative value. It can be like punishment for the user, right? And so there are some things where it's going to crash. But all of these. 
these are examples of high severity bugs. Great. Could we imagine a bug that's high severity, but it might be not be viewed as a giant concern? Yes. So it, it crashes on basically in a situation that's extremely unlikely to actually inconvenience any real user, right? Yeah. Um, so that is that is possible. That's a good example. Because partly because of this fact that not all severe bugs are worth fixing, there's this other categorization called pri called priority, and it's different. Priority captures sort of the degree to which it's worth fixing, the value to be gained by fixing it. Okay, and it considers priority, but it also considers importantly the chance of of this defect materializing. What's the chance it will actually come about? Okay, you can think of it as kind of risk is exposure. And there may be some things by the same token. So we know some things are high severity but low priority. Extremely unlikely to happen. Happens only under extremely well-defined conditions that we can warn people about. A very, very simple workaround. Mm -hmm. Especially if it requires lots of effort to fix it. We may decide, hey, too risky to fix it, right? Too risky to fix this, particularly at this late juncture. We have a trivial workaround. We can warn the user. The user will be crystal clear, be able to avoid it, no problem. Okay. Um, but give me something that's high priority but low severity. Something that something that doesn't cause your system to to crash or to corrupt data or freeze the whole system or what have you. But it but it's something that we really want to fix. High priority, yeah. Um, so let's say there is a button on your UI that doesn't do anything the first time you click on it, but yeah. like you need to click on it again, but it's a really, really commonly used button. Yeah. So like yeah. the user would run into it like every time they use the system. Yeah. So. Okay, good. So it 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 just would be in the user's face all the time and it would seem erratic, it would question lead to them to question the confidence about your software. You know, about is this software really working? It's like half the time I have to press it twice or three times. What what's up with this? Yeah. It can be as simple as just a spelling or grammatic error. Exactly. Something that uh, like help documentation or Good. Or like Good. Um so you know you're now a software professional software developer and you put out your proud member of the team that puts out the new version of Office and it comes up and it says Merco Soft Office. <laughs> um, that, that would not be something that's terribly severe, but it's it, it would be such in people's face. It, it's just an embarrassment. You've got to fix that, right? Um, you just you have to fix it. It's embarrassing. It's, it's something which might not directly inconvenience, inconvenience the user, but it happens very repeatedly, so with very high likelihood, and is therefore worth fixing. Anyone else? Back there? Yeah. Okay, so so there's a lot of bugs which may be high priority but low severity, and there's some that are high severity, low priority, and there's some that are both, right? High priority, high severity, where they're aligned, and low priority, low severity. Okay, um, and it's during the triage process, T-R-I-A-G, that we decide, hey, look, how are we going to marshal our limited resources? We have limited resources, limited programmers available, limited you know, software development time, effort, and energy. How are we going to spread that energy around to accomplish you know, the best we can, to accomplish the, our potential as much as we can realize it? And the triage process involves that exact sort of reflection. And often this involves a um, project manager, maybe a triage lead, whose job it is to consider these trade-offs, and maybe the test lead and the development lead. Ideally, all of them would be a sub 
upset at any one occasion. And they've got to decide, okay, are we actually going to fix this? Are we actually going to fix this, this uh, defect, this reported defect? It involves consideration of priority, severity. It involves understanding of the user's psychology. You know, are they are they really skittish about whether our system's stable, and so we might really want to fix things that are important for that? It does involve considering, often as part of priority of the risk involved in fixing this. How could fixing a bug be risky? Okay. Yeah, you might you might cause a bunch of new bugs to crop up, particularly if it's in code which is really difficult to understand, is really tricky to write the first time, is very crufty, we don't have time to redo it, to refactor it entirely, and now we're trying to go in there surgically and change something, <coughs> it might cause problems. But ladies and gentlemen, worse than just causing problems, it might cause problems at a time where we don't have a good chance of being able to have a second chance to fix those problems. It might occur so close to the client demo, for example, or so close to our shipping or releasing this to the public or what have you, that we're not going to have a chance to do a thorough testing of the system. We're not going to have a chance to really pound on it and fix any new bugs. So this is the devil we know versus the devil we don't know. I mean, we stick with the devil we know. We know about this. We can warn the user. We have time now. We're confident about where the location of the defect is. Whereas if we went and tried to fix it, we might end up in a situation where, okay, we fixed the successful defect. Three others have popped out we don't know about. We can't warn the user about. We don't have a chance in hell of fixing them. And they could be worse, right? Ever seen that? Yeah, okay, so deadlines are not limited to school. You know, they occur, they occur in all walks of, of life, and here there's a very important balance that's undertaken during the triage process. Do we want to fix it? Okay. Um, now, if we do want to fix it, then this becomes a important bug. This becomes a bug that we know we're at. The hunt is on. The effort is on. Why do I say hunt for important bugs? What do we first have to do? We have to, before we fix it, we have to find, yeah, find it. Find the faults behind the failure. We may see a crash. Where is that crash occurring? Does it die here in the code or here in the code? Where is it reaching? That's all process of bugs. Um, so we got to go locate that and build confidence. That's indeed what's causing it. Identify the fault behind that failure, that observed failure, and and then we got to fix it in a reliable way. So this may be assigned to to a developer. So maybe the te the developer developer lead might assign somebody to this. But often the developers just choose it themselves. They go to the defect list, they see, oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. So it's a UI bug, eh? Well, I was responsible for writing that code, so I'm pretty comfortable with that. I'll take that one on. Someone else might take on a bug related to the database infrastructure. Sometimes people take on bugs they don't want to, but just someone's got to do it. And you're familiar with that technology that's involved or what have you, right? So, Various developers may take on take on some of these defects. Um, I say assigned to, but it's they may often they'll choose to take it on, and then at some point they'll presumably fix it. Sometimes they'll reassign and they'll say, "I I can't. If someone else take it. I've got to take on another thing." Right? Um, I'm going on vacation. I couldn't fix this in time. Put it back in the pool of important bugs. But at some point. One of them is going to presumably fix it, well, for if it's been triaged. And then that goes into a state where it's believed to be fixed. But guess what? Sometimes it's not fixed, and further testing may reveal that it's been discovered and goes back into important bugs. But in many cases, it will sit in this believed fix case where it's marked as fixed in the database until 
person who reported it initially verifies that it's now fixed. In which case we call it resolved. Okay? Then a test team at some point confirms the elimination, confirms this is passed, and they'll make it a closed case. Done. No more updates required in this case. Why is it important that the reporter confirm that the bug is fixed? Why not just take it on what the developer wants at face value? is considered past history. Any questions on this process? Now to keep track of where a given defect is here, you're going to be using that information in a bug report. You're going to be marking that it's now an active bug. You're going to be marking that it's assigned to something. You're going to be marking that it's fixed. You're going to be marking that it's resolved. You're not going to keep track of this in your head. You can be marking this in a workflow system like Track or Jira. Both of those have served students well in the past. Track is used within our department. I use it very frequently, and it's really it's a really good system. Um, so you know, often here there's a bug fix, um, there's a bug report received. The developer uh, is assigned it at some point, or or chooses elects to take it on, they submit a, a, a bug fix. At some point, that's released to the testing group for, for pounding on, and you know the testing team will check, hey, is this problem indeed fixed? Okay. This is from a, a great reference. I need to have a, a, a citation there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about defect reports. This is a transition, right? Um, let's talk about defect reports. Um, so what are in these defect reports that knit this process together? What's in these reports that flow along this pipeline? Well, in, the, in a given defect report record, such as maintain a zero, you may find a wide variety of fields. And, and different systems, like uh, the RAID system, or Bugzilla, or Jira, they're going to have different different fields commonly, but some very, some um, ones that are representative or, or uh, common are, are shown here. So title of the bug, brief title, so someone scanning a list of bugs would have some idea of what's involved, right? And they can decide, hmm, maybe I should, do we want to check that out? If so, maybe, maybe I'll take it on. Priority, so I was referring to numeric priorities before, but you know, must, must fix, will fix all. Severity, how severe is the bug? If it, if it occurs, how bad is it? Um, a reproduction formula. So some, some guidance, some steps that will allow you to see this bug be manifest. Now that doesn't have to be deterministic. In other words, please do not think, well, if it's not, if I can't reliably reproduce it, it's not worth the bug, bug report. It is. Someone else might find a way to, re, uh, to reproduce it reliably. Someone else might see it and say, you know, I could come turn that too. Go look at yours and say, 
You know what's funny you mentioned is I was seeing it when testing this part of the system and you mentioned that same step. Maybe it's that step and it allows them to you know, zero in on what this is by having multiple eyes looking at it. So you need a, a suggestion of steps you go through to create this box. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, bring up the system um, and it crashes immediately or bring up the system and select this item. But sometimes it's more involved than that. Sometimes, you know, you have to you know, click this, add one, you know, uh, fill out three of the, the items in the survey, um, then say quit, and it crashes, or something like that. Um, okay, person it's assigned to in the project? Who's assigned or who's taken it on? What area of the project? Is it UI? Is it back-end database stuff? Is it server-side issue? At least one of the projects in this room is going to be spanning multiple platforms because it's got the data's got to be backhauled back to a database, and and you know those, that will have different areas associated with it, and even even uh, applications that are running more or less purely on the phone. There might be some things that do with the uh, administrative interface, some things having to do with the UI, some things more having to do with the core business logic about whether to bring up. A, person or what happened. Who opened it? Who reported it? The status. Is it active? Is it an active button? Is it a fixed button? Is it resolved? Is it closed? Is it unlisted? Um, why was it resolved? Was it a duplicate, for example? A duplicate bug? Um, decided it won't be fixed? Too risky or, or um, otherwise uh, not worth fixing? Is it fixed? Um, what type of bug is it? Is it a regular bug or is it a regression? Is it a bug that's come back from before or a feature that's stopped working now? Um, and uh, was it or is it triage? Was this bug examined for whether or not we're going to fix it and, and it was decided? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, um, so these are defect tracking. Uh, defect tracking uh, attributes we just talked about. Let's now transition to talk about uh, creating bug reports. Okay. So here, in a good bug report, we're trying to uh, we're trying to give a recipe, as it were, for other people to see this, this, this uh, evidence of this failure, so that they can pursue it. And um, you know, typically this involves not just rushing off and submitting something immediately, but doing a bit of a structured explanation. You may have gotten to this failure by a whole bunch of steps, and you want to figure out which subset of those steps was most critical and, and pretty soon. Maybe 90% of those, maybe 99% of them are are uh, not not important. They're they're incidental. They're not they're not uh, required for this bug. And you want to do a structured explanation to try to figure out a reliable way to reproduce it, hopefully you check, test it several times, with a smaller set of the condition. Um, so you're trying to isolate it, maybe come up on um, very well-defined conditions. You want to figure out sort of the general rules to allow it to come up. You compare whether it existed in the previous version of the software that you used for example, that could be really helpful to know is this is this new? If so, it might have been something changed between these two versions. It gives a lot of a lot of chance to, to, to localize it more easily to figure out where the, the bug defect came in. You want to summarize it very briefly in the description and condense it down, make it make it brief, disambiguate it so it's not it doesn't include a lot of uncertainty. Someone reading it could misunderstand. Neutralize it. This is very important. I saw this um, in my first professional development activity. Sometimes there's real, um, real tensions in place between uh, testers and developers. You don't want testers to be viewed as the thorn in the side of developers. You don't want them to be viewed as, as needling the developer, saying, "Hey, I found a bug in your code, buddy. Um, you know, uh, why don't you put out some pieces of code?" On like that. <laughs> you want them, you want it to be a neutral thing so that it, it doesn't unnecessarily raise the hackles, raise the raise uh, uh, you know uh, response.
response, anger responses on the part of developers. This is not a small thing. Sometimes in teams in this class, you can get developers and testers at loggerheads. And partly it's a reflection of the fact that developers don't like problems in their code being found. And you can do that in a more graceful way, or you can do it in an in-your-face way. And I'd say try to do it in a more graceful way. It can be a good partnership involved. It doesn't have to be confrontational. And then finally, review it. Just make sure it's got the necessary information. Good bug report can save the person who takes that on, you know, an hour, time. It may made them with confidence say, oh, this is better suited for someone else. So, so when you're going to submit a bug report, to try not to just rush it up. I recognize that there are sometimes uh, uh, exigencies, there's sometimes expedients that are needed. You've got to record it because there's other things come up. And I understand that, but try to do as best you can to have a bug report that, that can save the person time. Think some about that, and that's not gratuitously uh, sort of neatly um, Okay, in terms of reproducing bugs, folks, um, look, if, if your use of the of the system in reproducing this bug is going to change anything, you want you want to be able to reproduce it on a reference point with respect to known situation before it comes up. And to make sure that situation stays known, a common baseline under which the bug will repeatedly occur. If this system is using data, like it leads in from a database um, to figure out you know, what, what to show next or what have you, you want that database to have the same contents in it every time, right? So you can reproduce it. So it does the same, goes through the same step. And this is especially true if you're trying to get this bug to be, reproduce, be reproducible. You want it, you don't want to just say, oh, well, it occurred before, now it's not occurring. It must be intermittent. It must be a, a bug that's unreliable. Or, you know, uh, uh, it's hard to reproduce. I'm not going to be able to reproduce it and I'm, forget about reporting it. Don't do that. Remember, a lot of the time you can't reproduce this because something changed. Each time you were running it, it was actually not running off common situation. It wasn't running off a common reference point in terms of the situation that was in, a, in effect when the program started. Maybe there were some changed data in the form of files. Maybe changed database contents. Maybe the time was different. Maybe it was as simple as that. But you want to try to try to run it under the same conditions to whatever degree possible. Maybe it's something like, well, if you're doing something for a for Android, for example, maybe this bug never occurs when you have a freshly rebooted phone. So you can shut it down, start it up, things are hunky dory, fine. But, you know, if you run this thing after several other apps, that's when it occurs. You want to be able to have it in a common situation. So you want to pay attention to what you're doing. You know, was this phone just recently rebooted? Maybe you want to see, does it occur if I reboot this phone fresh, does it still occur? That's a common reference point. Do you understand that? But that's not everything. I mean, if it's using a database content or if it's reading things from files, you want those to be the same. So make a copy of any data that can be destroyed or modified by the program. So a bad thing that can happen is you run the program and then you've lost the common, what could have been the common reference point. So you make a copy, then you run it. And if it occurs, great. Then you can put the original data back and see if you can run it and get it to do it with fewer steps. Try it again. You know, if, if you can or can, you can try it again and see if you can do it with fewer steps. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, you might want to generally jot down what you're doing. You know, what are the steps you're going through? Even external things. You know, whether a, a network is acting flaky, whether it's really congested. These could be important for situations where you're sending things over the network. But especially if you are doing things like rebooting the phone or taking a call in the middle or whatever, this could be important for figuring out what's going wrong. So just remember, it's important to try to, to, try to have that common baseline point for this thing so that when you say it's not reproducible, you're, you're confident it's not just because something's changed before you started it. So you want to prepare
prepare the situation, prepare a test procedure, execute it, evaluate it, and then restore the test environment back to its original state. Okay. Um, so here's some problems with, uh, with reproduction. You do get cases where there's race conditions. Things are just slightly off in how long the disk is taking to get some information versus how long, how long it takes for the UI to be updated. There's forgotten external details. You did something unintended, you forgot, you took that call in between and it changed the situation. Um, maybe the bug changes the state of the system. Um, it, when it occurred, it changed the file and you weren't correct for that. Um, maybe the heap has been fragmented by many steps and sometimes it's fragmented in just a bad way. This is particularly true if you're doing C code. Or loose pointers can, can have different effects you know, when you detect them differs based on the structure of the heap. Maybe it's the only occurs the first time that the program runs because it changes something. Um, it may depend on on time, the availability of resources like disk space. Um, maybe the machine has been disrupted by someone else logging in and something like Tux World or what have you. Um, and uh, you know, it could in some rare cases it can be uh, can be hardware, etc. So here are some common cases with uh, reproduction of, of bugs. Okay. Um, Okay, let's just uh, check the timing here, and I may transition to a final. Right. Okay, maybe I'll just make some brief remarks on this. One of the other uses of test reports, such as test reports emerging from the testing we've just been talking about, is they can inform decision making. They can inform, for example, the project manager's choices, or the dev lead's choices, or the test lead's choices. You think about it. If the test lead is monitoring the bugs that have been reported, the defects in the system, preferably sanitized defects, so they're confident that they're distinct, significant, or well grounded. If they review them and they start to see a lot of them having to do with the UI or this piece of the UI, they might select that as something they want to test manually. Go in and do some more testing on it. Maybe we should write some more scripts. Look at your test matrix. How many scripts do we have? pounding at this area of the UI. Maybe we got to write some more tests because this, this looks suspicious in terms of the number of, of bugs. In terms of decision making, um, there's also a set of overall statistics counts that you might really want to report back for decision making. I'm not suggesting you do all of these necessarily, although, right? But you um, might want to ask, for example, what percent of the tests that we've been running work, are working properly, reporting correct results. What, what fraction of the tests we've written are, are successful? That can be some indication of, of the quality of the code base, right? If it's failing most of them, we've got a long way to go. If it's, if it's passing almost all of them, hey, we may be on to something here, but maybe we've got to expand our test set. How many test steps are complete within those tests? How many? How far do they get through them? Defect age of closure. How old are defects when they're closed? Why would I want to figure that out? Why would that be important? How how uh, how old the defects are when they're closed? Maybe you're having a hard time. Keeping up. Yeah, maybe you're having a hard time keeping up, and it takes a long time to to resolve those defects. And you want to know that. Maybe we need more testers, right? Maybe it could also be impact the user's ability to remember what went wrong, their ability to sign it off. So that may be a sign that the testers really need help uh, in some way, and we might want to focus attention on that. Yes, John? I was just going to say efficiency. Yeah. Uh, so maybe there's something if you make uh, fixing all those bugs uh, more efficient. Good. Yeah. Something that, that could be used to help, uh, help the testers handle the load. Um, and better um, support in the form of, of uh, uh, computational support for their tasks. Maybe they can, should have recourse to more machines to test, what have you. Okay, time is running out. Uh, I would just note that uh, time until you retest a fix to see if it's worked. Um, um, you could see if that's uh, off base. Okay, um, I'll leave you um, with one little challenge and I'll, I'll post the slides after class here. Um, I'd like you to 
take a look. If we have a graph over time, this is time on the x-axis, on the y-axis, the number of bugs fixed per week and the number of bugs found per week. We were to do a graph of this, and this is one of the metrics I'd like to suggest, right? How many bugs are you discovering? Say how many how many new sanitized bugs are there per week? And how many bugs are being resolved or closed per week? If we were to show that in a graph like this, and I'd like to be able to create a graph like this, it's great to know kind of where we're at. Where do we have the maximum number of bugs? Where do we have the minimum number of bugs? And when are the number of bugs basically staying stable? Think about this. I'll post this. Check it out, and we'll talk about it next time. Okay? Thanks very much. Yes.